But when we sing victory in Jesus, we know that there is truly victory in Jesus. When we sing Love Lifted Me, I, I didn't just pick a couple of songs to sing because they're fun and easy. No, I picked two songs to sing this morning because I believe them from my heart. They mean something to me. They're very meaningful to me. Victory in Jesus says you have victory in Christ. You already have it. We don't need to be down. We don't need to be, you know, God just said to me, Peter, look at all I've done for you. Look at what I'm doing for your people at church. Look at what, what I'm doing. I'm changing lives. I'm helping people. I'm blessing people. I'm meeting needs. Look at all the, the good that the church is doing and the people are doing and the love that's being shown. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Because, you know, Satan can get our hearts sometimes. He can get a grip on us, and he can cause us to be down and to be depressed and to look at life the way God would not have us look. I want to give you six things today that will help you look at life in the right way and to understand who you are in Christ and what you have as we face 2013. Because that's a very, very important thing that God has given to us. We look at the new year and we think, what's going to be new? in 2013. What could possibly be new that we haven't experienced already? And we look at life and say, well, it's not so good, and how could it get worse? It's not going to get worse. It's going to get better. It's going to get better for the Christian, because when you consider the alternative, you're on the winning side. Come on, church. You've got to put a smile on your face and joy in your heart. You're on the winning side. You are victorious. We look at others and say, boy, I wish I could drive that Boy, I wish I could live in that. Boy, I wish I had that. I wish I had that credit card. I wish I could go out and buy that. I wish I could do that. Listen, you are so rich. You are wonderfully rich. The things that other people have are lacking. The things that other people have will wilt and, 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 die, and dry up and be gone from this earth. All of the things of this world will pass away. But you know, my mom had on the wall only one life. It will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. When I leave this world, it's the things that I did for Jesus. It's the things Jesus did in me. It's the changes that he made in my life that really will count. Nothing else will count. Nothing else. I've had a number of wonderful blessings. I was looking at a, a, a booklet that was given to me when I left the church in Florida. And... Um, it, said, it, it was labeled a blast from your past. And what they did before I left was they gave a sheet of paper from this book to the families of the church. And the families were to find some pictures or photos or something that I could remember those individuals. And then they bound it in a book about so thick. And each page was different individuals and notes, personal notes. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And uh, I was looking through it last night. I just kind of flipping through that thing remembering some of these people I haven't seen for years, and the majority of them have gone on to be with the Lord. I've been here almost 15 years now, and the majority of those folk have gone on to be with the Lord. You know, it's Florida. Majority of them have gone. They're with Jesus now. But I'll tell you something. What wonderful, precious memories. And I looked at the things that were written, and I looked at the, the, the thoughts that were, were expressed, and time after time after time, I read, you blessed my life. I loved your preaching, your ministry, your, your, uh, your teaching, and you have encouraged me, and you have done things such as that. And I thought, Lord, the only thing that really counts in my life is what I can put into the lives of others. Amen. And it's, that's, it's just that simple. It's what I can put into the lives of others. It's not how comfortable I am or how, how well off I am or how wonderful things are for me. And you think that way, and I think that way. And that's a common way to think. How can I have just a little bit better than the next person? How can I have a little more than what my parents had? How can I, how can I give my children a little bit more? How can I? Listen, what we have is precious, and it's a gift from God, and it's the love of Jesus Christ that will never fail you, will never leave you, will be your comfort, will be your help, will be your guide, will be your strength, will be your encouragement. All of these things God has given to you. And that's what the world lacks. 
and they can sing what the world needs now is love, sweet love, and what the world really needs is the love of Jesus Christ. They need to know him as personal Savior. I was talking with a gentleman just this past week, and he was telling me how he believed that Jesus was a prophet, but he did not believe that he was a son of God. He said to me, God doesn't have any sons. God doesn't need any sons. There's not three parts to God, there's just one. And we all believe in the same God when we walk this pathway. And God's going to give to those who have done well good. And God's going to send those who have not done well to a place they don't want to go. And he believed that. He knew there was a separation somewhere. But he based it on how we live and how we walk and what we do. And I thought of this passage of scripture in John 3.16 that we quoted this morning and how important it is. And we're going to look at that in just a moment, but I want you to take out your bulletin because inside your bulletin is a little, is a little uh, page that you're going to fill out this morning. I have an outline in there for you on the sermon, and I trust that you'll follow along and fill in the appropriate blanks. I think that'll be helpful to you. And let me share these thoughts with you. Father, we thank you for this blessed privilege of not only coming into your house to worship you. Thank you for the music. Thank you for the time together today, for the testimonies for what we share in Christ. And as we look into the new year, we wonder what's new. We know you make all things new. We, knew that, we know that your love charges us with new things every morning, that your grace gives to us newness in our life constantly. And it's never the same old thing. It's always a new blessing. It's always a new path that you have us walking. It's always something wonderful and new, and we thank you for that. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'll help us today to see the things that are important in our own individual lives. Help us to grow in you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you're doing. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. What's new when we know Christ? What's new when we know Christ? When we know Christ, things are different. Remember that. When you know Jesus, things are different. Now, I want to give you a few things. The first thing he gives to us is new life forever. We quoted it in John 3, 16. I want to read a few verses around that, if I may. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now you can't tell me that there is no Son of God because my Bible says that God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son. There is a Son of God, and it tells us in this passage why he sent that Son of God, and it says that whoever believes in him is it important that we believe in Jesus? Of course it's important we believe in Jesus because the scripture tells us that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting. I just wanted you to say that word. How long does it last? It's everlasting. When God saves us, he saves us from now through eternity. Everlasting life, eternal life. And that literally means from now and forever. And listen to what else it says. It says in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Listen to these words. God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We think, you know, God condemns us for everything we do. And we're going to have to give an account, and we're going to have to stand before God, and we're going to have to give an account for all the, and all, there's going to be condemnation and all of this. Listen, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, there is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You're not condemned. And here's <laughs> this, this comparison verse says it. He who believes in him, verse 18, is not condemned. I mean, is this precious or is this precious? He who believes in him is not condemned. But listen to this sad part. And this is a heartbreaker for me. I've spent my life telling people they need to come to Christ. I've spent my life trying to get people to come and to embrace the truth about Jesus Christ. And it says, but he who does not believe is condemned already. He who does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God is condemned already because, and he makes it clear, he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hasn't believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
You can tell me that there are many paths that lead to God. And I can tell you, my Bible says, you've got to believe in Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And all the religions of the world try to tell us that, oh, there's a way to God. You come follow us and we'll take you to God. Listen, I don't say come follow us. I don't want you to come to this church and follow us. I want you to come and follow Jesus. Come on, church. I want you to come and follow Jesus. That's the message you have to proclaim in 2013. You've got to tell people they need to follow Jesus. Take them to this passage. And <clears throat> this is the condemnation that light, in verse 19, has come into the world. It's condemned. And, and then it says, And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Do we have to say much about that? The evil deeds of people? And we look at the world and we say, How much more evil can it get? How much more evil can it get? How much more warped can minds become? Sad things happen. If you're telling me that you weren't crushed when these children were shot in that school and when all the things that happen in our society, and I hear of brutal beatings and all kinds of things, and I say, how in the world can people even do these things? What is in the minds? Listen, this says they're lovers of darkness rather than light. Look at all the black clothing. Oh, I know I've been guilty of wearing some and so forth, but not for that reason. But look at all the dark clothing that people wear. Look at the dark places they go. Look at the thing. There's darkness in the world. And verse 20 says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light. They don't want the light to be shined upon them because when the light shines upon them, it will expose their deeds, verse 20 says. It'll expose their thoughts and their attitudes and their, their life. Verse 21, but he who does the truth comes to the light. He who does the truth comes to the light. I didn't say he who believes the truth. I said he who does the truth. God says this is the way you walk in it. To do the truth means to walk in the way of the Lord. How are you going to walk in 2013? You're going to walk in a path that you choose, or are you going to walk in God's way? He's given you eternal life. That eternal life includes all the things that God has for you. And it goes on to say, But he that does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Yes. You know, that's an interesting question someone just raised. What happens to the souls of those who have never been introduced to the Bible? That's all in God's hands. And I know you might say, boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's an escape. You're sure getting out of this one, preacher. I'm not saying it for that. There are a lot of things that we do not know and understand. I know this, that every life is in the hands of God. I understand that we do not know and understand exactly how those things. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us exactly what happens to those souls. Those people who have not. I'll tell you this. When you go into the book of Romans, and I don't want to switch and go to a different uh, topic here, but this does beg the question. You go into the book of Romans, and it says, the second verse, Therefore, O man, thou art without excuse. It starts the second chapter of Romans. You read it. But first of all, read the first book of Romans. And it's, I mean, the first chapter of Romans. Because in Romans chapter 1, it tells us that God has made himself known to man. God has shown himself in creation. God has shown himself so many different ways. So God has a plan to take care of individuals somehow. God has given them light. And here's the thing that I believe totally and completely. And Christian, you listen to this because this is important. The more you know about God, the more responsible you are with that knowledge for what you do with that knowledge. You hear me? The more you know about God, the more you understand, the more responsible you become to God to live up to what you know. That's what God teaches us. So God has uh, somehow given light, and that light is given to all creation. 
Read it in Romans 1 and Romans 2, and I think that'll answer your, your question. Okay, Jane? That'll take care of it. Good. The first thing that God gives us is new life forever. You know the neat thing about it? My dad used to say this all the time. I mean, I heard him say it on a, a number of occasions. He would say this, God doesn't take your old wretched life and make it over anew. He doesn't take your old rough life and clean it up and fix it up and do those kind of things. God doesn't do that. You know what he does to us? God imparts to us new life. God implants in us new life. Everything that talks about your relationship with God deals with a new life. You have a new life. So with living within us, we have a new life and an old life, and there are still some problems and complications that come from that, but that's a whole other sermon, and I'm not chasing dogs today. I'm not off on the wrong track here, but I want to tell you this. I'm telling you that God has given to you a new life. You still have the old life living within you until you go to be with the Lord Jesus, and you're glorified, and that old life causes trouble sometimes. But Romans, again, keep reading it, chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, boy, you're going to learn an awful lot. And when it becomes clear to you, hey, God has to have control of my life. I need to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh and all of those things. So God is very clear about those things. First thing God gives us is new life forever. The second thing is this, God guides us into the plans he has for us. God guides us into the plans he has for us. I don't know what your plans are for 2013, and I want to tell you something. I don't even know what my plans are for 2013. You say, well, don't you do some long-range planning? I've heard that that's a good thing. Someone tells me there's souls in goals, so you need to set some goals. I have some personal goals for my life and things that I want to do. I've spent some time alone with the Lord already. I've been on my knees talking to God about 2013 and what he would have me to do. And God has given me a number in my head of individuals that he wants me to reach for Jesus Christ this year. I've made some commitments to God already. I don't know where you are and what you plan to do, but it's a good thing to do that. And it's not quite the end of the year yet. You've got time to do it. But you need to get before God and say, God, what would you have me to do? But here's the thing. God guides us into his plans. You see, God gives to us a new direction. Everything with Christ is new. You have new life. That life, life lasts forever. You have a new direction. You change. Do you know what conversion means? The word literally means to be converted. We talk about being converted to Christianity or whatever, and that word literally means in the Greek that I'm walking this direction, and I turn right around, and I go exactly the opposite direction. Are you getting that? Say, I got it. Okay, good. I want to make sure you got it, okay? Because if you're going one way, you have to change your life, and you have to change directions. And conversion, we talk about conversion. I've been converted to Christ. I belong to him. We use that word. Listen, in Psalm 119.35, the psalmist said, teach me to live as you command, because that makes me very happy. You know, you'll read it in yours, it might use the words a little differently, but this is exactly what it means. Teach me to live as you command, because that makes me very happy. I don't know what your direction is for this year, but I'll tell you this, you better be going the way God sends you. We can change the way we act. One of the things that disturbs me so much, Tim's back there shaking his head because he was just telling me early this morning of a number of people that he's been dealing with and helping and ministering to along the way. And Tim has an active ministry with the lives of people and, uh, and so forth, and he works in marriage counseling and things such as that. But, 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 but the, the way people behave is the problem. Can you say amen to that? It's the way people act. You know, people don't decide to get divorced because they get tired of a person. They, get, they decide to get divorced because they don't like the way they're acting or somebody else is acting. Or it's, it's the way people act. It's the things that we do. And listen, God can change that. And there's one way God changes your actions. Actions are changed by attitude. If you need to write that out, that's okay. It's there on your sheet anyhow. But actions are changed by attitude. When my attitude is changed, when I have an attitude that says, look, 
I'm going to go God's way. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to be a blessing to other people. I'm not going to worry about what I have, but I'm going to worry about what others have, and God will provide for me along the way. When I get that into my mind and my whole attitude changes, then my actions are going to change. Do you get it? When my attitude changes, my actions change. So I get before God and I say, God, here's my life. And I lay my life on the line before the Lord. And when I lay my life on the line before the Lord, I say, I no longer own this life. I no longer have control of it. I no longer even have to provide for it because God's going to provide for it. I don't have to worry about things. And the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by, through prayer and supplication, make your requests and needs be known unto God. And it tells us that God's going to provide. That God's going to provide. He's going to provide everything. God's going to provide for you in 2013. He's going to provide your health. He's going to provide your wealth. He's going to provide everything you need. All the spiritual needs you have, everything, God will provide. He'll provide happiness and he'll provide comfort. He'll provide joy. He'll provide all of these things. I know people have a problem with happiness, but I want to tell you something. Did you read what the psalmist said a moment ago? He said, if I walk in your way, I'm going to be happy. And that word there literally means that. It means, it means hilarious. It means to laugh and be happy and joy, enjoy life. And some of you are going through life looking like you just ate a bowl of prunes or sucked on a lemon or something, you know. Oh boy, life's terrible, life's miserable. Listen, I know life has problems. I know there's a lot of issues. I suffer them, you suffer them. And Satan, you know, the more you, can, more you commit your life to God, the more Satan wants to just continue to, to, to hammer you and cause all kinds of issues and all kinds of problems. The closer you get to God, the more difficult life becomes sometimes for you. But that's when you know that God's there. If you're not down, if you're not hurting, if you're not going through struggles, if you're not into problems and things like that and issues aren't plaguing you, then how do you know that God delivers you? How do you know God's care? How do you know God's love? How do you know God's peace? How do you know God's strength? How do you know God's help? You don't. It's in the valleys. It's in the valleys that we walk through. It's in the difficulties. It's in the struggles that we know that God is with us. We're on the mountaintop. Why do you need God? You just need yourself. We're doing fine. God takes us through the valley for a purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. People always think that has to do with death. I know you say, somebody asked me about it the other day. Dealing with death. No, the valley of the shadow of death was a, was a place. It was a road that people traveled. It was a valley that people walked through. And they called it the valley of the shadow of death. It was a place where a lot of robberies took place. It was a place where people were beaten. Remember the Good Samaritan in the scripture? He was in the valley of the shadow of death and somebody beat him and left him for dead until the Good Samaritan came along. So when I'm going through that valley of the shadow of death, death is looming, death is, the shadow of death is upon me. Because this is a terrible place to be. And you know about those places because you walk through valleys of the shadow of death. Where you can be fearful, where you worry, where you... He says, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Nothing's going to harm me. Why? Because thou, God, art with me. I just want to scream hallelujah. hallelujah. I just want to shout hallelujah this morning. You know how many times I've walked through that valley? It has nothing to do with my friends and family dying, but it has to do with struggles and difficulties and things. I never thought I would recover. I never thought I would come through that valley. I never thought I'd get out of that mess. I've been in that valley of the shadow of death. And I'm not going to ask for hands because I believe every hand would go up here this morning. You've been there too. And you know what I'm talking about. See, so I say, live by the Holy Spirit's power. Then you will not do what your sinful nature wants you to do, Galatians 5.16 says. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you want to read it in King James. This is what it means. 
So I say, live by the Holy Spirit's power, then you will not do what your sinful nature... Lord, I don't want to go my way. I don't know where I'm going, but I know you're going to lead me in this year, and I don't want to go my way. So Lord, give me the right attitude. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm talking with Jesus. I'm in the garden with Jesus, if you want to sing that song. I'm on the hilltop with Jesus. He's with me every day. He's with me all the way. He's with whatever song you want to sing about walking with Jesus. I'm walking with Jesus in 2013. I'm not walking alone. When I go back to that house back there, I'm not alone. Jesus is there. When I walk into this place and there's no one in here and I'm sitting back there working and doing things, I'm in the office, I'm not alone. Jesus is here. Wherever I am in my car, I'm not alone because Jesus is there. And so I say, I want to live by the Spirit's power so I won't do what I want to do. I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. God will help us to see our, with our hearts. You know, we see with our minds so often. We need to change our attitude. We need to see things with our hearts because God is the one who controls my heart. You see, the heart is not just this thing that pumps blood. It's not just a vessel that pumps blood, but the heart is the seat of my affection, where my affections sit, if you will. It's called the seat of our affection. That means the things that I love, the things that I want, the things that I desire, my affections, my desires, my wants. It's that seat. And so God will help us see with our heart. I look at people and I look at things and I don't like what I see sometimes. But I have to look past those things and see with my heart. You see, God gives us a new vision. God changes our vision. I know that there are times when people come to a church and they're looking for help and they're going to the next church and looking for help and the next church and looking for help, the next Christian, the next person, and so forth. And I, I know what they're doing. I know that. There are people taking advantage of Christians. There are people taking advantage of good people. There are lots of people like that. And the first thing I say is, well, I don't want to do too much for them. I want to make sure others get help. I want to... But listen, I want to tell you something. God changes our heart. We begin to see people from the heart. And these poor people have serious problems, and they need some kind of help. And what do we offer? We offer a closed door. I'm not going to help you at all. I don't care about your situation. I don't know. No, what we need to do is help those people. And sometimes we're not helping them by giving them money. We don't help them at all. I make that a point not to do that. What I do is I'll feed someone or care for someone or clothe someone or do something to help them. That's the way we help. And that's the important thing. But God has to give us a new vision. We have to stop, stop looking at things the way the world looks at things. We have to stop looking at things the way the flesh looks at things. And we have to say, Lord Jesus, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? And sometimes what God wants me to do is not what Peter wants to do. It's not my will, it's his. But those who trust in the Lord will receive new strength. They will fly as high as eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not grow weak. I want a new vision. I want a new vision every day. We'll talk about that in a moment. God will help us to be like his son, Jesus Christ. We have one goal, and that goal is to be like Christ. And God makes us new creations, a new creature. He who believes in Christ is a new creature. Old things are gone, new things have come. Oh, I know, if anyone believes in Christ, he's a new creation, old things pass away, all things become new. All things are new. The old is gone and the new things are coming. Listen, God is changing you every moment of every day. And in order for him to make what he wants to make of you, it takes time. It's like the clay on the potter's wheel. He doesn't throw a lump of clay on there and presto, poof, it's a beautiful, beautiful vase or whatever it is. No, the potter has to turn the wheel, press it, mold it, shape it, do all of those things. Throw water on it, dampen the spirits, if you will. And he has to do all of those things and work and knead it and do all of those things until suddenly there's a great creation. Whoever believes in Christ is a new creature. 
you are not the same person you used to be. One of the problems is we're so caught up with self. And you know there's a saying out there, get over yourself, you know. That's very common now. And sometimes I just want to say that to Christians. You need to get over yourself. It's not about you, it's about Jesus. I couldn't tell you the number of people in this church who have learned in the last few years of their life. And I'm learning it more and more and more. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. I want you all to say amen if you've learned that. Amen. Amen. See, you're learning that. I know it. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. You know, how can I? Oh, listen, we're a new creation. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God forgives his children. What do you have to go to him with today? What do you need to take to him? You say, Lord, I need forgiveness. Listen, there never is a day when you don't need forgiveness. We have to be cleansed continually. Why do you think 1 John 1, 9 is written to Christians? If we confess our sins. What? Wait a minute, I already confessed my sins. No, you confessed your sin. You confessed your sin. You confessed your sinful condition. Lord, I am a sinner. I need to be changed. I want new life. I want you to come into my heart, and I want you to forgive me of my sin. And I want you to take that away. Cleanse it. If we confess our sins, then afterward. Because, you see, I talked about the two natures a little bit ago. Yeah, you still have the old person there. Boy, sometimes that old person, you know, the old nature just rises up. And you want to be a good Christian, but right now I can't be a good Christian because I'm really mad. And I'm having problems. And I, huh? You know what I mean? And then you say, oops, oops. Lord, I know you're not happy with me. and I don't need to ask how many times you've had to do that. And don't you dare ask me how many times I've had to do that. I couldn't even begin to count them because there are times I'm so thankful God forgives me. Listen, there's nothing you've done before you became a Christian or after you become a Christian that God doesn't forgive. How much does Jesus forgive? Someone just said this much. He hung on the cross to forgive you. He forgives you of your sin condition, brings you into the family of God, and then constantly we have to continue to confess our sins. You see, the scripture tells us in Lamentations that his love is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God gives us a new beginning every day. And I'm thankful for New Year's. New Year's is important. It's important to have a new year. We just change the calendar... And sometimes we say it's the same old, same old, you know, the same thing as last year and yesterday. What's the difference? But no, God gives us new opportunities and gives us opportunities every day. Our prayer should be this. God, I ask you to give me all the things I need in my life to live the way you want me to live. I ask you for those things. And you know what? If I give my my will to him, yield it over to him, I can live to please him in 2013. And you know what? You may be my judge. As I'm your pastor, you may look at me and say, well, he's our pastor, and we judge him, and we look at him, and we see. Listen, I want you to see Jesus in me. But there may be moments when I don't show you Christ, but I want to. My heart says that, all right? I want to. That's what I want. But you know what? More than anything in this world, I want to live this year to please Jesus. And I'm asking you today to join me in that. To say right now, bow your heads and just say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I want to live the way you want me to live. I want you to change my heart, change my attitudes. Thank you for a new beginning. Thank you that all things are new in you. Thank you for the new life you've given me, the new direction you've given me, the new attitudes you change in my heart for a new vision. I ask you for a greater vision. I ask you, Lord, that you'll give me a new beginning every day and every moment that I live. I'm so thankful that Jesus makes all things new. Bless his holy name. Father, I thank you for this time together we've had today as we've looked into your word and we've taken this simple outline and looked at these thoughts today, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will make this very real to our hearts. You'll help us to realize, Lord, that we 
are not out here on our own, that you walk with us through every valley, through every difficulty, through every struggle. And you're with us on the mountaintop and when things are good and you never leave us and you never forsake us and you're always with us and Lord, you require of us obedience. Jesus said, Lord Jesus, you said that if we love you, we will keep your commandments. We'll follow you, we'll walk with you. And I pray that you'll help me to do that and you'll help each one of us to do that. Father, we give ourselves to you right now. I pray that if there's one person here who doesn't know you, that even this morning they will find that you not only can change their life, but you can re remove their sin. You can give them absolutely new life. And I pray, Lord, for the rest of us as Christians, we'll make a new commitment to you. Thank you for what you're going to do, even in the days ahead, and for what you've already done for us. We bless your precious name. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.